If you're going to talk about Mickey and Minnie Mouse, and we are, why not go right to the horse's mouth or the mouse's mouth? The mice's mouths? How do we say that exactly? Mises mouths? The Mises mouths. Well, we're talking to the people who are. You're not only the voices of Mickey and Minnie, you sort of embody Mickey and Minnie, don't oh, you? Thank oh. you. That's Wayne Allwine and Rusie Taylor. That's one of the, the things I've noticed over the years, though this is my 25th year doing Mickey, is how in time you actually realize those characteristics that the character has in yourself mm -hmm. you know and I I've, I've got all his uh, naive qualities <laughs> all his optimistic that's qualities why we have an agent here. that's right <laughs> um, and Rusi's Rusi has Minnie's tremendous uh, love of people sauciness sauciness yes it's the and sauciness. sweetness sweetness and yeah I mean it's, it's there do you think you could really portray those characters successfully if you didn't have those qualities in yourself no. No. Mm -mm. No, it's... No, it, it's funny because you, you have to bring yourself to the character, but because of these particular characters, they actually enhance who you are. Mm. They really do. They make you, in a sense, they make you better than you were before because there's a lot to live up to. It's a, it's a legacy. Mm -hmm. Let's start by examining Mickey's voice. Now, Walt, of course, was... Mickey in more ways than one, and he did his voice for many, many years. You've listened to Walt, certainly, uh -huh. and you've listened to his successor, yeah. Jimmy McDonald. Yeah. How do you differentiate them, their voices, their approach to Mickey, or do you? Well, Walt was a, a high baritone voice, naturally, and he smoked, which brought his pitch down. If you listen to the early Mickeys... Come on! We gotta hurry! you hear a higher voiced Mickey than you do say uh, the last time he voiced Mickey was for the Mickey Mouse Club back in 1955. Hi, Mouseketeers. Hi, Mickey. Well, what's going on today? It's a different voice. Mm -hmm. And the, the man aged and of course, as I say, the smoking dried out the vocal cords which lowered the pitch. Walt's early Mickey has a lot of energy and a lot of feistiness. And as he gets older, he sort of becomes the guy next door. He becomes an everyman, really. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy's Mickey was interesting. Jimmy was a bass, nice deep voice. And for him to do Mickey, he had to really work at it. And you can hear a, a, a texture in Jimmy's Mickey that you don't hear in Walt's. Yeah, fellas, I sold the cow for some magic beans. I'm a tenor, so for me the falsetto is actually higher, higher pitched, I think, than Walt's, just slightly higher. Listen to this. Earn $999.99 for a mindless day's work. Oh boy, I'm back in business. The thing that's interesting is when I started back in 1977, uh, Mickey was already a star at the theme parks. Mm -hmm. So I'm an old rock and roller and I approached Mickey from, from the attitude of uh, a big rock show in a stadium. You've got to literally send that energy out to everybody. So whereas as Walt and Jimmy worked on the screen and Jim worked a little bit on TV, my job was to take him even further, keep that energy up, go out and, and really drive the character. And I've managed to, to sustain that so far. Do you remember Jimmy giving you any tips, any advice? This big piece of advice to me uh, to sort of keep the character in check, my ego and the character's <laughs> ego in check, was just remember, kid, you're only filling in for the boss. It's really not about me, it's about Mickey. And Mickey is Waltz. So what I do is I get to, to take this wonderful American icon and, and keep it alive until the next Mickey comes along. And it will one day. And that's, that's also one of the, the, the heartbreaks of the character, of doing the <laughs> job, because, you know, yeah. I'm three, there's going to be a four. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's holding him close enough to really love him but not so close that when he leaves, it's going to kill me. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll, I'll always be annoying to, to think people like grandchildren. Come here, let me do Mickey Mouse for you. <laughs> but it's a, it's a great honor, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a great honor to, to represent what, uh, what Walt loves so dearly and what Jimmy 
kept alive so well. You both talked about how the characters kind of rub off on you in a way. Would you talk a little more about that? Why you think those characters are so indelible? There's an approval factor from the characters to the public. The characters aren't judging you mm -hmm. and they never will. They're just going to love you. And I think that's the kind of thing that people want and it, it, it keeps people coming back for more. Mm -hmm. It's love, you know, mm -hmm. people want love and if there's something out there that will just simply give it to you without any, any judgment factor, they'll love you for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always the pilgrimage to Disneyland when you have your baby so the babies can meet Mickey and Minnie. We're sort of like everybody's approving parents, I guess. I, I don't know yeah. what it is, but, but the kids have their own memories. The parents have their memories of interacting with these characters mm -hmm. and they want to share it with their children. Yeah, that's uh, that's, that's mm -hmm. generations now that that's gone sure. on. Sure. And you see the babies run to Mickey and Minnie in the park and they just, I mean, they just are in love and they're given love back. I think that's a lot of it. I really do. Because mm -hmm. we genuinely love these characters, mm -hmm. but we do love people too, and mm -hmm. I think that comes across in what we do. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something that I hadn't thought of before, till this minute, honestly, mm -hmm. which is that Mickey and Minnie's relationship is one of unconditional love, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's total... Acceptance. The characters are, are scripted to, to always be uh, in love. Uh, either Mickey is playing the hero and, and rescuing Minnie from the clutches of Pete or a bad situation. It doesn't mean that we don't have spats on script, you know, now mm -hmm. and again, but that's always settled and it's settled well and nicely. Really, oh. in a sense, enhances the characters. I really do believe that mm -hmm. because we do a lot of um, radio interviews uh, down at the parks and um, uh, we we just roll. We Our timing improvise. Is, is phenomenal. Yeah, we've, but it's because we're together all the sure. time, and 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 you know we do love each other, you know, and mm -hmm. and that comes across with the characters. Do you have uh, some favorite Mickey moments from the early classic cartoons? Are there are there some mm. some either cartoons or or scenes that uh, that you particularly cherish? We both love Steamboat Willie because that's where we came from. That's where our characters came from. Yeah. And, and just hearing uh, Minnie squawk in that show, which by the way was Walt, as you probably know. Mm -hmm. He did both voices. I go back to the times when, when Mickey was a bit of a rascal, when he could, he could uh, pick up a couple of mallets and play uh, a turtle's shell like a xylophone, mm -hmm. or he could crank a goat's tail and produce a music uh, box sound. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was a time when Mickey could sit next to Minnie while she was playing Pop Goes the Weasel mm -hmm. and snapped the elastic band on her, her shorts, her underwear. You know, <laughs> and he does it twice. And, and she smacks him <laughs> one. And she smacks him one and says, Don't you do that. <laughs> it's such a treat. I mean, you, you, you watch the character evolve over the years. The black and white films like Plane Crazy, you know, the Lindbergh craze was reflected. And I was thinking on the way over here, too, how, how back then and, and what's going on right now are sort of the same. Walt, Walt entered the scene when technology was changing. Mm -hmm. You know, you had the opportunity. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you had the opportunity for for sound, and now we look at what's going on, going from from traditional animation to CGI, mm -hmm. and and the wonderful things that are happening, the growth in the art form. Yeah, Walt would love that. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, it's it's just just a treat to see. I mean, we 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 have such a legacy to live up to and such a legacy to draw from. It's funny, you know, people ask us all the time, what would Walt think of all the changes and what would Walt <laughs> think of all, the, like we're gonna know what Walt would think, you know. <laughs> but the truth is, it, because he was an innovator and because he loved things that were new and he wanted to try everything and, and in fact with, with Ub Iwerks did invent a lot of oh, things. Yeah. I think he'd be thrilled with what's going on. Oh, absolutely. He was a futurist. Yeah. He was a visionary. Yes. He'd be riding high with all yeah. of this new technology, yeah. I think. Yeah. You think about everything he accomplished, Walt's imagination, Roy's fantastic business sense, mm -hmm. and Ub Iwerks' mm -hmm. ability, his pencil. Mm -hmm. What a team, mm -hmm. huh? Yeah. Three people created an empire. Mm -hmm. yeah. What a wonderful marriage that was, huh? How did you come to work for Disney? I had wanted to work for Disney since I was a kid, but didn't know how to get in. Well, one of the bands I was playing with, uh, Tom Jackman's father, Tom was leader of the band, his father, Bob Jackman, ran the music department. And Bob gave me a, 
an application and a recommendation, and I started in the mailroom way, way back when. And uh, the thing that's funny is a little, little known fact, Bob Jackman, after Pinto Colvig had left the studio, Bob supplied the voice for Goofy in a, several of the cartoons. I mean, really, really a good match. So in essence, Goofy hired the future Mickey. <laughs> it was one of those little odd, odd things that occurred. But I started out carrying mail. Uh, I saw Walt uh, a couple of times, but we only spoke once. He was very sick. And uh, it was a magic time. It really was. Uh, 1966, John McCarthy was running traffic, as the mailroom was called back then, and just said, take a walk around and see what you want to do. So I walked around, and uh, the first thing I thought of, well, I've, I've done some acting. Wardrobe looks like fun. The love clothes, love clothes. Did that for a while. Uh, went back into traffic and said, gee, I don't, I don't really know what I want to do, Mac. I, I might leave. I, think I might leave for a while and just see what's on the outside. So great. I left, and I got a call about two months after I left saying, would you like to come in and learn Jimmy McDonald's job? Now, at the time, I didn't know who Jimmy was. I mean, I, he was just another fellow on the lot who walked around with a lot of pencils in his pocket. <laughs> and I, sure, what am I supposed to do? Follow Jimmy, do everything he does. <laughs> so I followed Jimmy, and I learned how to do sound effects. Jimmy only voiced Mickey for radio interviews, occasional radio interviews. I think he was on the Dave Letterman show twice. But other than that, he didn't do Mickey. He was having trouble holding the falsetto because mm. he was a baritone and he oh, was I'm, like I, 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 I've told this story a few times, so <laughs> I tend to leave things out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was having a rough time and couldn't really voice Mickey any longer. And the studio had an open audition. Uh, an actor didn't show up. There was a call from the soundstage, send the kid down, he works with McDonald. Three months later, Lou Debney stopped me and said, kid, you're going to join Screen Actors Guild, they're going to use you. And that's how I became Mickey Mouse. Ah, hi, folks. Hi, folks. This is Mickey. I'm Mickey, too. You are? I thought so. Well, you are now. OK. Jimmy uh, was nothing but supportive. You know his history probably better than anybody. Tell us a little about him and what he did. Jimmy grew up a young man back east. He was short, like his mother. He had a brother that was also short. His father was six foot eight and the heavyweight <sighs> boxing champion of the British Army. Hmm. So it was kind of rough on this big man to have two little sons, and Jimmy uh, had kind of a rough childhood, but uh, nonetheless, he turned out quite well. He was a musician, uh, played in a lot of jazz bands back in the 20s. He, for a while, was a member of what they called the Black Gang on the uh, steamship lines. He would go and shovel coal into the boilers. And eventually, he found his way to Hollywood. Uh, he had a degree in engineering. But he went back into his first love, which was music. Mm -hmm. And it was as a musician on the uh, recording sessions for the early cartoons that Walt heard Jimmy, saw that he had more gadgets, as he called them, than anybody else in town, and hired him to come in and do his sounds, as he called them, for the cartoons. And Jimmy was uh, Walt's major sound effects man. You name it, all the gags that you hear in the old cartoons, that's Jimmy. The train in Dumbo, Jimmy. He built these things. He used his engineering skill to design props that were usable for what's called Foley sessions or, or creating sounds to picture. Mm -hmm. And he was a genius at it, and nobody better. He also was uh, an excellent mathematician. He used to drive me crazy when I first came in. He'd want me to, to watch a scene in a movie and then break it down musically. Somebody's footsteps. What tempo are they, are they walking in? Oh, it was rough. It was hard <laughs> because I, I'm sitting there and I've got all these click loops and I'm trying to... <laughs> and I'd go back and he'd say, no, no, see, these are like quarter notes. It just, it just works like this. And I, oh, I, I banged my head against the wall for a while until <laughs> I went down. Jack Wadsworth uh, was the music editor at Disney at the time. Uh, he and the fellow uh, Ray Craddock that ran sound effects took me aside and said, kid, we always have to adjust Jimmy's footsteps. <laughs> They're never perfect. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, I wish they'd have told me earlier. <laughs> but, but he was an, a, an absolute uh, phenomenon. He was a wonderful teacher, 
a very, very good man. I just was so lucky to be asked to shadow him. As you say, he invented a lot of what oh, he yeah. did and built a lot of what he did, and that was, that's a time when that was what the radio sound effects people uh -huh. did, yeah. too. Yeah. One of his, his favorite gags was to take a, a single BB and drop it into a balloon, inflate the balloon, twist the end, and then rotate the BB inside of the balloon. It gives like a... Is that that's is that, that's Herbie? Isn't that's it? from Herbie. Right. The lover. And today it's all cartridges and chips right. and, and all of that. I mean, not in the Foley sessions. They still right. do a lot of it the old-fashioned way. Uh -huh. But but sound effects have become more mechanized, oh, I yeah. guess, than they were then. Well, when I became a, a sound editor, I realized how much of a show is actually cut from what they call hard effects, pre-recorded uh, effects of of actual sounds. Mm -hmm as opposed to, to the Foley that I did for, for films and for television. The thing that's interesting and really a treat for me, Leonard, I gotta tell you, when we did House of Mouse, mm -hmm. which is the animated weekly series, at that point, they had gone through the sound effects library and put a lot of Jimmy's original Foley effects on CDs. So in essence, Jimmy Foley'd House of Mouse. I hate that saying. Then I don't want to get all weepy about it, but it meant a lot to me. Of course, the question was always, how did you get the job, Jim? <laughs> yeah. And Jimmy said, well, uh, I was down here working one day, and Walt called me into his office and said, can you do Mickey? And Jim said, I don't know, Walt, I never tried. Said, Let's hear you. And Jimmy did a few lines, and Walt said, that's fine. From now on, call Jimmy, I'm too busy. And that's the way it was before, you know, and Walt said, well, here it is. I mean, becoming Mickey has never been a great fanfare with trumpets <laughs> and balloons. I had Lou Debney stop me and say, kid, you got to join the Screen Actors Guild. They're going to use it. Jimmy got, yeah, call him from now on. I'm too busy. <laughs> Such is Hollywood, huh? Yeah. The, the processional trumpets were the, never the, the heard red of. carpet. No, 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 no. never happened. Okay. <laughs> too bad. How did you come to be cast as Minnie? Minnie hadn't spoken for a long, long time except by uh, a man down at the park, the great Jack Wagner, and also Barnett Ritchie, who is the amazing woman who created Fantasmic. Mm. Uh, Barnett had done Minnie as well. But in general, she hadn't really been. In fact, when you did uh, Christmas, Christmas Carol. Carol, they didn't know that Minnie could speak. That's why she doesn't speak in the show. <laughs> They decided somewhere along the way, somewhere around about 85 or 86, with totally many to bring her back. And there were, oh my goodness, there must have been about 160 people who auditioned for her. And I got lucky, very lucky. The best part is that I, you know, ran into Wayne and, and here we here are. We are. <laughs> Magic. Just like your alter egos on screen. I think that's lovely. Disney magic, huh? Yeah. The other question that, w that has gone un <laughs> unasked and unanswered yeah, is, is how you two became a couple in real life. Well. Ready? Begin. You do. <laughs> we, uh. You know I'll interrupt you. Anyway. I know. I, I, thought, I just thought I'd give you an opening there. We, uh. <laughs> uh we were working on a, a project with Bill Farmer, something that we had hoped to, uh do for Radio Disney. And anyway, she noticed one night that I wasn't going home. <laughs> and I noticed that she wasn't going home. And we just went out to eat to talk about the project. We were actually writing. And I got to know her better. It was just a total friendship. The next thing you knew, we were just sort of like always together. And Yeah, we're, we're together all the time. We're just a couple. Happy anniversary, Minnie. <laughs> You're so romantic. Rusty, do you remember what you did on your audition to, to win the role of Minnie Mouse? I prepped by listening to the 30s and 40s Minnie mm -hmm. and tried to find a combination of the two because mm -hmm. there was just a little slight difference. And, and I tried to find a blend, which I seem to have done. And <laughs> I just had a grand old time. But then they wanted to know if I could improvise as Minnie because I guess it's, are you really her mm -hmm. and if you can improvise and and so on and i i remember just you know rolling my eyes for a second and thinking i'll do the balcony scene from romeo and juliet <laughs> and i i did and and cracked up everybody everybody laughed really hard it's like um let's see oh thou knowest the mask of night is on my face oh thou 
else would a maiden blush be paint my cheek for that which thou hast heard me speak tonight? <laughs> fain would I dwell on form. Fain, fain, deny what I have spoke. But farewell compliment. Dost thou love me? <laughs> well, of course thou dost. I'm going to put both of you on the spot with a kind of a Rorschach test. Uh -oh. The first word that comes to mind to describe Minnie Mouse would be? Sweet. Sweet. That's a good word. For Mickey? Optimistic. Optimistic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That says a lot about both of those characters. And in a way, it's kind of what makes them endearing and enduring. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they go on because people enjoy something nice mm -hmm. and something optimistic. Everyone seems to say, everyone who had any dealings with Walt uh, uh, agrees that, that Mickey was his alter ego. Yeah. And that Mickey really represents his spirit, his own optimism, yeah. his... Um, determination, stick -to all of those qualities, uh, and his essential goodness. Tell the story about how Walt came to do Mickey one last time. Walt had one last shot at Mickey, <laughs> and Jim said he was on B stage doing the lead-ins to the Mickey Mouse Club in 1955. Walt peeked around the corner of the booth and said, you know, I can do that. And uh, I know that one day I was doing something, and Walt came on the dialogue stage, and uh, I was doing something, and when Walt left, he turned around to the fellow and he said, hey, don't forget, I do Mickey's voice, too. Yeah. And Jimmy said, well, well, come on in, Walt. Go ahead. And, of course, Walt proceeded to record all of the lead-ins, <laughs> and that's, that's the last time that Walt did Mickey. Hi, Musketeers. Hi, Mickey. Big doings this week. I heard you tell that story yeah. once at the Disneyana convention, oh, yeah. and then I went back and listened more carefully to those Mickey Mouse Club lead-ins, and you can tell it's Walt. Yeah. It is just fascinating. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah. Gosh. It's so interesting because we all lived through a period when Walt was alive, yeah. uh, though didn't get to know him, sadly. Uh, when Clarence Ducky Nash did get to was, work still, with Clarence, was yeah. still out there and, and doing Donald and doing personal appearances and all that. I guess Pitt O'Kavig was before our time, our yeah. collective time. But now, you and you and Tony Anselmo, who does Donald, and Bill Farmer, who does Goofy, are all really carrying on this wonderful tradition with great spirit and enthusiasm. And you all, I think, which is wonderful, have a sense of history. I really want whoever comes after us to... to be aware of the history and, mm -hmm. and the tradition and to love the characters as much as we do. Mm -hmm. I think that's a prerequisite. True. Exactly. Yeah. And the thing is, is great is we all are friends. All of us mm -hmm. get along. And Billy and his wife Jenny oh, yeah. and Tony and it's just, so it's, a, it's a great family. Mm -hmm. Really great bunch. Yeah. We're so lucky. <laughs> we really are. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you are lucky, but also I think all of us who love these characters are lucky that you're, you're here doing this. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you for saying that. That's awfully nice of you.